Yoink. All right, here is the plan for the rest of the week. Um, I'm going to finish up on unit two material today, levers and pulleys. We are going to spin Wednesday. I guess I need to decide. We're going to spend one of these days on Wednesday or Friday having a class conversation on your um, uh, on your project. I want your feedback. The more I thought I was, I was like, let's get some feedback on uh, some of the things that go into. I'm not a project person. So what I'm trying to protect against is asking too much of you guys when you have other classes, other projects, other things. And also, I want to try to make sure that it's useful to your application of some of the knowledge uh, that we gained. So, uh, one of those days, uh, we will uh, probably Friday. Um, and then you have your unit two exam coming up next Wednesday, if I'm not mistaken. So that'll give us uh, next Monday's kind of being a review uh, for everything. So. Cool. So give it some thought. Um, remember, the intent is to apply some of these concepts to a sport, a skill, looking at a lot of different things that go into that sport or skill that the average person, and maybe yourself, heck, I do it all the time, doesn't even realize or think about. Again, like different levels of um, you know, children versus adults, or beginner versus advanced, or Equipment effects on the skill and psychological effects on the skill. What about weather? Does that affect the skill? There's all these different cool things that affect the outcome of that particular skill, lift, exercise, movement. Okay. All right. Going back to levers, a couple of things I want to uh, clarify and mention. You heard me say this a lot in 310. There is a lot of different words for things. The thing itself is the thing, it's, it is. But what we call it can vary from region, person, pet, you knew, uh, as I've used before. So in terms of levers, several biomechanists engineers will use these terms. Um, a stands for the axis, which I, I don't find that term at all. Axis of rotation, we have our axes, planes and axes, okay? The F you'll see sometimes, especially where I was going to school, meant your muscle force, the muscle internal force. I always kind of, that seems a little odd because anything can be force. Uh, force is the A influence, it doesn't have to be for your muscles. And the R in our lever arrangements in some textbooks and some is resistance. And that always inferred the external influence. Okay. And kind of going over, you know, I wonder how they teach it. I wonder how engineers teach it. I'm just kind of looking over. These, even though fulcrum and axis, I prefer an axis to it. I like this because one, I've seen it in several places. But the thing I like about it is effort kind of infers our because we can vary our effort, right? You know, the the dumbbell can't vary its effort. <laughs> it's got to fix, right? It is what it is. But we can vary our effort to it. So I kind of like the term effort as inferring our internal contribution, our muscle forces that are acting through our um, hands, feet, bones. And then the fulcrum is just another term for axis. And the load is just another term for resistance. Potato top. So when I talked about the arrangements of levers and how first, second, third is just really how you rearrange these three components, 
I don't think I emphasized enough that it's examples of those rearrangings are um, on this slide itself. So I wanted to make sure we define, you know, even though it says it here, I wanted to make sure I define that effort is just another way of saying our muscle force, our effort, uh, two things biomechanically. The fulcrum is just another word for axis uh, about which the rotation occurs, and the load is just another way for resistance. Any questions or clarifications about levers? So remember, you have these, in, 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 in mechanics, you have these simple machines, the wedge and the screw rows. For our bodies, we utilize simple machines and levers and pulleys. That's kind of how our bodies can take advantage, okay? And for your projects, that may come in handy when you're looking at things. I think I use this as an analogy, but it's I didn't, I apologize. You know, when you're swinging a baseball bat or a softball bat or heck, even a golf club, that's a lot of force needed to make something move fast, especially when the mass is so far away from your input. It's like, um, I think I used this when I was talking about moment of inertia. The further the cases of coke are in your shopping cart, the harder it is to turn the corners. The more stuff you have far away, the harder it is to turn. So think about it, a baseball bat has most of the stuff far away. Because when you collide with the ball, you don't want this to be light. You want it to have mass to it, right? So it actually it takes a lot of force to make something move fast. So how we compensate for that is with the leverage. So in other words, my hands are providing a effort. Here's where the axis is. Well, you can technically look at it in, in between my hands because one hand might be pulling and the other hand might be pushing. Okay. But the point is, is that when my effort works close to the axis, what do I gain as the advantage? Speed and range of motion of the distal center. So this is how I can use leverage to help gain a function towards further into my hand. So bats and, and uh, equipment can also be viewed in these classical mechanical leverage operations. I want to mention this. Uh, before we go on, maybe some of you, this was every year we get further and further and further from all of history. But anybody familiar with the steroid era of baseball? Right? Mark McGuire, and Sandy Sosa, and those guys. Where their advantage, anybody familiar? Right, I don't want to have to start the way that we get. So one of the, uh, one of the debates about why it wasn't a big deal is, well, they still had to hit the ball, right? And this was so much fun. We used to have these debates all the time when I was at Auburn. They already were able to hit the ball. Like, they already had the gift of pattern recognizing. Their computers were already at an elite level to make contact with the ball. The gift that they had by being stronger and being able to hit the ball is with leverage. Their force that they could generate close to the axis meant an exponential speed of that distal segment. Massive motion, momentum, but even better than that, their real advantage, the real advantage they had is, if I was facing, I love a now, all right, I love analogies because analogies kind of help us use life data to understand sometimes these physics concepts. That if I was facing a major league pitcher throwing 90 miles an hour, guys, 90 miles an hour is fast, right? Maybe not to the pros, but I'm no pro. If a pitcher, if I was at, if I was taking BP at UL and a pitcher was throwing 90 miles an hour to me, I'd have to start my swing like literally before they were releasing the ball to get a chance. Because if I tried to like follow the ball, it would be like, 
right? I'd have to start my swing early to even give it a chance. They can be susceptible to off-speed or heck, they wouldn't even need it. They can just throw it down there when I get it. Now imagine this. Imagine a player who was already at a major league level of skill. Being able, having the strength to take this bet from point A to point B in less time, a fraction of a second. In other words, they don't need to start their swing early. They can actually start their swing later and still be able to make contact. Imagine the advantage of being able to track that ball a little bit longer to decide if you were going to swing or not. Why do you think some of those guys had so many walks? Because they could literally get more data and be like, nope, that's not my pitch. But before they had all this extra strength, they would have had to have committed <laughs> to the pitch sooner. Huge advantage. Don't let anybody tell you that. Huge advantage. So what I'm not saying is Brian Campbell on the gas, Brian Campbell on the sauce, I could play pro. No, 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 no. These guys have already played football. These guys have already pattern recognizing the data. It just allowed them the advantage of being able to see that pitch with more time and more data and thus be able to meet that with all. Not only with more power, right? Work in terms of time, but in terms of having, it was almost like the pitchers were showing more of their hand. They, they couldn't deceive them as much because those batters were able to get more data before they swung. Did anybody happen, you don't have to answer this, but did anybody happen to watch the little short video that I put down there? I thought it's really cute. I think it could also be pretty helpful. All right, let's get to pulleys. Pulleys can help serve our simple machines in a few different ways. Um, for, for our bodies in particular, mostly they help redirect the force. Um, think of it, it, it's almost kind of like a, you know what it's like, kind of like? It's like a non-rigid lever. Remember how levers, they help redirect the force, right? I'll pull down one end, the other end goes up. So imagine if like the rigid link of a lever just became a, a rope. It's really kind of what we talk about. If you go to a Smith machine or where there's a cable and there's a wheel, it's kind of like a, a rolling lever. I push down on the handle and the weight stack goes up. In the weight room, I'm going to get to our bodies in a little bit, but in the weight room, all this different equipment, they utilize pulleys because gravity only has one way to pull. So through the use of pulleys, we can redirect those forces so that when I move the fly machine across, the weight stack still goes up. And when I move the barbell down, the weight stack still goes up. Okay. Changing the direction of applied forces. Pulleys can also kind of increase our leverage of applied forces from these ropes. Our ropes are our tendons, our muscles, those are our internal ropes. So um, they have what I love about this sheet. This is actually the same sheet I got when I was at Auburn. Um, the different pulleys, so class one, that would be kind of like our patella tendon. where our quad tendon is coming down, it's pulling on our tibial tuberosity. Having the patella that our tendon can pass through gives us a much better angle of inclination on our tibial tuberosity than if that patella tendon wasn't there. So in essence, it kind of pushes that tendon out a little further so that it can come in at a steeper angle so that we can have more torque, more moment, 
as an as the extension for. I think this is a good little example right here. Okay. Class two, the action of the muscle at the point is changed because of the pulley. So this is actually an example of the weight room where, you know, our, we're doing this, but something else is doing something in a different plane <laughs> because of the pulleys. And so this is an example. We have some of these, we have, we have cable pulleys that change direction literally in a different plane, like in our eyes. Like we have muscles that go one way, and because of the pulleys, it can make the eye do other things. Okay. How often do we talk about the eye? I don't know, maybe one day you may be an optometrist that you can get to that. Okay. But we're definitely not going to be learning eye muscles in this class. Class three, the joint itself well technically the, the, the yeah the joint or the bones of the joint so think of it like this instead of the patella serving as kind of that um that depth for that muscle to pass through and thus have a better angle it's like a little bit like the condyles part of the bone so the, the patella is like a floating bone right so it kind of gets its own special case but you have condyles that can also serve as a pulley to redirect. So think about it. Look how look at that line of inclination. Like um, like if we were going to apply our Cartesian plane, um, that gracilis muscle would be coming down, probably at an angle roughly 260 degrees from the horizon. Then when it gets to those condyles, those condyles kind of push it out a little bit, and then it goes down into the insertion. So in essence, think of it like this, that muscle can technically not only pull on the bone that it's inserting, but because it's kind of wrapping around those bony condyle parts, it can actually kind of pull on those bony condyle parts too. It's kind of cool. Another way of looking at it is, anybody ever have a tennis elbow? And they make those little straps, they kind of tack down your mobile water three. It's kind of similar, where the muscle, you get stress off of this part because you're creating a new origin for the muscle by tapping it down so that it's not pulling on the origin that's deeper. Very simple. Or the patella strap that tacks down, it kind of creates an origin for that tendon to pull off of so that it doesn't get down to it. Very simple. That muscle, yes, it's tugging on its insertion on the tibia itself, but because it's wrapping around those condyles, it's also yanking on the condyles themselves. It's creating a surface area of that muscle. Make sense? Three chairs for condyles. What you got? For that one, where you talk about which joint exactly were you talking about? This would be this would be a knee. This would be specifically a right knee. And so the well, the joint that I'm talking about, the bones, the condyle serving as the pulley would be those knee bones, but it would, in terms of what their advantage would give you, it would be in terms of the hip motion. So in other words, when that muscle is pulling, and it's trying to bring the inside of the knee over to the pubis, having that muscle curve around through a pulley mechanism around those condyles almost kind of likes to allow that muscle to pull all of that part of the bone, not just where it's inserted. So even though the knee is acting as the pulley, the motion would be in the muscle that's influencing the motion. If that makes sense. Here's another way to look at it. If we were using our imagination and I was going to attach a rope to the door and the rope attached here, and I pulled this way, I would have like this much moment arm, you know, from the axis. But if the rope curled across here and still attached on the same place, I'd technically be yanking from out here. So I would have more of a moment arm, even though it's inserting on the same place, it would be going around my pulley, and therefore I'm pulling on the distal part of the handle. Make sense? All right, 
class four, the muscle wraps around the pulley, causing the pulley to rotate. Um, so basically, these are specifically for certain types of joints. Uh, we have what we call pivot joints. And so these types of class four pulleys are muscles that are just trying to rotate the revolving door. In other words, kind of like the joint itself and the muscles that influence it uh, serve as a special kind of pulley. Um, the muscle wraps around the pulley, calling, causing the pulley to rotate. So in other words, like my pronator teres would wrap itself around the radius, literally causing the radius to rotate about the whole. And so very specialized with spin and stuff. And then the last class, I think, is the most applicable to us in terms of making sense where the muscles themselves can be pulleys. So the patella, a, a, a floating bone, can help to increase a better angle of pull of the muscle. A non-floating part of the bone, the condyle, can help increase the angle of pull of the muscle. In this one, a muscle itself can help increase the angle of pull of another muscle. So the example here is you have uh, two big muscles that are flexion pullers. The bicep is the one everybody, that's the one that gets all the attention because that's the one you can see. But underneath the bicep, you have a brachialis muscle. So the bicep gets the piggyback on top of the brachialis and the better angle of pull. And so it gets all the credit. And then the brachialis when gets hit is like, dude, that, I've been carrying this guy my whole life. And you know, as long as you have a lot of these, um, your soleus and your gastroctor, you know, you've probably heard of these before, but we're going to go through them when you do uh, lower extremity muscles and the three. But the soleus is deep, and the gastroctor gets to use it as a pulley in the ankle on the elbow. So a muscle that's deep serves as a pulley for another muscle that's superficial. That's what I'm talking about. Muscle serve as pulleys. Anybody else do this trick? That's my only trick. And then I have a little short video on pulleys. So Whew, let's talk test. So for the test, just like unit one, I mean, if you saw the kind of questions I asked, very straightforward, definition based. I'm just seeing if you know the difference between this, because of this, because of this. On the test, I'm going to use this verbiage, fulcrum, effort, and load, because one, I've seen that consistently. And two, the photos that I found that kind of illustrate what I want to talk about use that verbiage as well. Okay. Effort is our muscles, load is our resistance, and fulcrum is our effort. So I'll mean the same thing. For um, going back to this one, I want to reemphasize something that I said last class, that in terms of leverage, we have to make sure we define. Um, you ever seen those, uh, those little puzzles and they say how many, how many blocks are there? Or how many squares? And then you find like squares inside squares, you know, when you're trying, there's like one big square, and there's squares within the square. So like if I were to have like a Lego block and it was in the shape of a let's say I had a bunch of Legos that I literally made a Lego with the Legos. And I was like, how many Legos? And it's one big Lego, but then there's a bunch of little Legos. So what I'm trying to say is with levers in the body, you can have like a leverage advantage that you define kind of like the big Lego, like, you know, push up. I can look at the ground pushing up on my hands. I can look at my toes as my fulcrum or my axis. And I can look at like my center of mass as kind of being the load, right? I can look at the Lego, like one giant Lego, but then I can see the smaller Lego system. 
can say, well, yeah, that's one kind of leverage, but what's allowing the ground to push on my hands? Oh, my hands pushing on the ground. What's making my hands push on the ground? Oh, these individual muscles. Those are efforts. Each, each muscle that's working has its own unique effort. And that unique muscle has a unique fulcrum or axis that it's pulling at. That makes sense? So when we get into specific muscles starting in unit three, these are the kind of verbiage and, and things I'm going to use. Like, notice how this muscle crosses in the back. So it's going to have a pull in this direction of motion. Notice how close it inserts to the axis, so it's going to have a certain advantage when it's doing certain things at a disadvantage of others. Say, look at this muscle, how far away it inserts from the axis. So it's actually going to have a new advantage, but it's going to trade off with a different disadvantage. Right? Muscles that insert far away are going to have more moment and torque advantage, but at the trade off of speed. Those are going to be some of the terms we're going to use as we're going over our muscles. So in other words, it won't just be this muscle does this. We're going to look at some of the advantages Disadvantages. It's going to be cool. I think it's cool. But before we do that, we just have to kind of understand what these terms mean, how they apply, and more than anything to me is these commonalities of trade offs. Human movement strategies, trade offs. Levers, trade offs. Right? Which you gain in one, you lose in the other, and vice versa, depending on what you need. All right. Any questions? All right. Well, I'll tell you what. If there's no questions, let's talk about, um, let's have a jump start on this conversation. So you guys have a skill analysis project. What I was thinking about with your feedback is something like this. I'm have to get to the right side. So something, something like this. So um, football would be, well, let's say soccer. You know, soccer, there's a lot of stuff going on. So I'm not asking you to do an analysis of soccer. I'm just asking you to pick one particular thing that could happen within soccer. So it wouldn't even be as broad as kicking the ball. Well, what's the context? Is it a penalty kick? Is it a uh, you know, is it a, 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 a corner kick? Is it a overtime? You know, sudden that just whatever that specific thing is, I want you to narrow it down to a specific skill. But I also don't want you to narrow it down to like you don't really have much to explore. Because that's really what this is supposed to be. It's supposed to be fun for you to explore stuff. So let's say um, you did a a corner kick in soccer. Okay? So that's your skill. For those of you that don't know, I'm not a soccer buff. I just know just enough sports to be able to sound like a moron when I'm talking to someone who actually knows sports. So a corner kick is like when the ball goes out of bounds and they let you take it in, like in basketball, you get to take the ball out. It's just in soccer, you can't, you can't. So taking the ball in bounds, you just got to kick it in back. It's usually a great chance to have better odds to score a goal when you're on your side because the body's in your way. They can't get right in front of you like in basketball. So basically, you have a free kick to try to get it into an area where maybe one of your people can kind of bump it in. Right? Okay. So some of the things not just in terms of before we talk about like the movement strategies and would it be more this or would it be more that 
We should talk about all the different kind of factors that go into narrowing down, like who's kicking. Like, you know, is it a corner kick in, I know they don't call it this, but, you know, Little League, like how they have going on, like little kiddos. I'm sure their corner kick is just going to be like, like, like different, different advanced stages. Or do you want to look at professionals? Professionals compared to high schoolers, professionals compared to, um, so, so in terms of a, a, a broader category is um, variations in skill level. Guys, some skills, there is no gender difference. In fact, some skills, females have more of an advantage than males. Shooting skills like rifles and shooting where, where, where it involves, that's why I like the, some of the best shooters in the world in basketball are females. Accuracy favors females. Okay, so your skill, the advantage may be with a certain gym. Your skill, a certain advantage may be with younger people. Hello, gymnasts. Like, like it's not like in some sports where like you have the grizzled veteran at 30 years old coming. Most of those gymnasts, I mean, Simone Biles, I think is kind of an exception to the rule, but when I was growing up, they were all like teenagers. So in other words, your window of optimal might be different for whatever sport, whatever skill. So you can talk about different levels of skill and how there would be variations in movement patterns. A novice, someone who's beginning, children, because they're not as strong, might have different movement patterns, might have different uh, ways to do it than an MLB play or, or, or a World Cup play. Another thing to explore could be you know, equipment. Maybe not so in soccer. Maybe, you know, maybe there is a difference in the types of soccer ball you play with. Maybe there is a difference in the type of shoes you play with. Maybe it is the shoes. Uh, again, maybe not so in soccer is this analogy, but maybe in baseball, maybe in golf, maybe in lifting. You know, I don't know, maybe in powerlifting, there's certain equipment that people favor than others because of certain reasons. So explore all of the different equipment variations uh, that could be in your skill. I don't know, maybe this could be a factor in how you do your corn kick. Like, is it brand? Is it, is it human? Is it cold? Uh, are we playing football on, on artificial turf? Playing on natural grass. How does your? I have a better word for this. It was escaping me for a second. This means forget my dislikes. If I see so your environment. So in other words, you can have the same person, professional. Trying to kick a field goal, is it raining? Is it snowing? How's that going to affect them? I'm trying to get, get that plant leg down and, and bridge it when there's less friction, might affect the kick. Little things like that. And these are just examples, just brainstorming examples. What might affect this? What about the stakes? I don't mean the kind you eat. I don't mean the kind that takes care of vampires. I'm saying, is this a regular season game? Is this the Olympics? Is this the World Cup? Is this, is this a Super Bowl? Is this, like, I think sometimes stakes might affect, and maybe that ties back to something, like, like mental, uh, you know, sports psychology and,
going to put this one, but it may or may not. You don't, guys, so here's the point is that your skill, you may not have any, you may not have all these, you may have more of these. It's just to kind of delve into all of the different factors that could go in to performing that skill. Of making a free throw. If you have free throws, like think of all the stuff that might go in to shooting a free throw. There are some, and especially if you love basketball, like there are some college settings, they go ridiculous on the distraction stuff. It's pretty cool. Would you, would it be, would it be easier or harder? And maybe there's no answer. That's what I love about this. Some of it's kind of subjective. I personally would rather a lot of people shouting and yelling versus like an empty gym. Like sometimes we play these tournaments and the gym is empty and you can just kind of hear everything. It's worse. Another factor you may look into is uh, like the stakes, but also like, you know, where in, you know, where in the game is this kind of happening? Kind of part of the stakes, right? Is it the is it the, the first? Is it the last? Or the first quarter? The last quarter? And, and, and that's a lot of this stuff. I have no idea about that. Your expertise. For you lifters, do you usually get like where does your optimal lift come from? Is it one of your first ones? Is it one of your middle ones? Is it one of your last ones? I mean, I can imagine if you keep going, you may get tired. So where you know where does that kind of lie? Does it vary between people? Also, tell me about these reasons of stuff. I know in track, when I'm in track, you got three attempts at something. They pretty much like, dude, if you haven't done it by now, <laughs> probably not going to do it. Get out of here. Well, boy, track, man, that was spikes and spike length. And when I was running track, we had different track surfaces. One um, surface in Centerville had like um, like asphalt track that was very far away from where these really small spikes. All weather track was there. We still had cinder, so you had like longer spikes. On it. That was a big deal, like to match up the spikes for the surface. I think that was pretty universal. Um, playing basketball outside, a lot of variables: wind, weather, dirt on the ball. So, the intent of this project with your help guiding me is to not just look at what motions are happening in something. I would love for you to compare and contrast a lot of different factors, especially if you can compare and contrast novices or people new to a sport or skill with maybe a more advanced professional crossfitter, lifter, power lifter, gymnast, football player, basketball player, Talk to me about extremes. How would someone doing it for the first time, how might their, um, what factors would go into that and what factors go into, and even when you're talking about the expert, like you can get into how that expert might have developed over time and those skills to be able to do that. It's open ended. What if we did something like this? Because again, anytime you get open ended, then that's some people are going to do more, some people are going to do less, and it's not, I know if, it, if you truly enjoy it, that doesn't matter. But what if, because you may be thinking of some different stuff too, what if like we came up with like a minimum number of kind of subset categories to talk about or explore, right? So maybe we could come up with a minimum number. So, um, Compare and contrast. So it's one skill beginner and expert. Is that fair? Because I think there's kind of a beginner for all levels of stuff, you know. First time you tried the power plane, first time you tried the, and that could also be like something like, like a progression. Like, like in other words, you may be a, um, a personal trainer, 
So you may do like, um, my skill is a muscle up. And the beginner won't be able to do a muscle up. But this is what the beginner can do. And these are some factors in that. And then we can progress to doing the muscle up. So in your world, it could be, you know, we're trying to get our, you know, beginner or, or one of my new players to eventually be able to do this certain skill. We're going to start here, and we're going to progress them, and here are all the different variables they go into, including rest, soreness, and just, it, to me, it's kind of open-ended, but it allows you to, for some of you that are in rehab, you know, maybe you, maybe you do, um, you know, you Someone through a process of they got hurt. This is what their function needs to be. This is where they're starting. These are going to be the benchmarks. Some of the factors we're going to have to deal with is pain. Some of the factors we have to deal with is how many times their darn insurance allows them to come to rehab. So that this meant to be open ended. Do y'all feel comfortable in kind of, I don't have anything on paper, but does that at least sound like a decent outline of something that would be worth your time to explore and try to learn and apply some of this stuff? You know, and I might even have some other rules like, okay, you got to use at least some terms from our <laughs> first units and use, some of, use a little bit of that kind of stuff, right? So in other words, if you're doing golf, Talk to me about the leverage of the golf club. That that I don't know yet, and, and I'm open to your feedback because again, what I, this is what I don't want to because I've never done this before. I don't want to ask for something and then all of a sudden it's like, bro, this is ridiculous. Because I mean, I don't want it to be ridiculous. So I'm, I, what I love about that is you guys give that some thought. Give that some thought. If you're brainstorming tonight, you kind of get some thought on, on what you think it would take to kind of cover these major bases, make it worth your time, and maybe we'll continue that conversation on either Wednesday or Friday and we'll put a full day into it. Making sure we're all on the same page for this little project. Is it going to be like this Yeah, I'm, I'm okay with discussing any and all options. I just know that me and reading sentences is tough. So presentations that involve pictures with bullet points or, or short sentences, like I will never ask you guys to do a paper because a paper for me is really, and then I don't want it, right? So, um, so we can talk about those kind of options to basically how do you get across the stuff that you learn in a mechanism that, uh, that not only I can understand, but I'm hoping you can maybe use this to help someone else understand something, right? All good stuff. Let's continue this conversation. What a great thing to talk about. Let's, uh, let's continue this conversation. On the I didn't say yes, I didn't say no, I'm open. I'm open to conversation.